was the blood applied glory to his Isn't this a beautiful sight? Uh, welcome. Welcome to Hearts of First Methodist this morning. This is a, a combination of worship and our vacation Bible school. The kids are going to sing a couple of songs and then they're going to go to their classes and we will continue with our worship service. We're glad you're here today. Let's listen. You guys stop your feet like that? Let's clap together. That's it. It's the light of mine. It's the light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. It's the light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. It's the light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. I keep clapping now. Sounds good. <laughs> Everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine, yes, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, that sounds so good. That's called clapping on the back beat. All right, sing this real quiet with me now. Even when I'm afraid, I'm gonna let it shine. Even when I'm afraid, I'm gonna let it shine. Yes, even when I'm afraid, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.
Brothers and sisters, we got joy in the house this morning, do we not? Yes. Help me, help me to thank Kelly and all of her volunteers for blessing our children this morning. Thank you, Kelly, and all of your team. I hope that we can get uh, them all um, appreciated as they should be. Y'all help me thank them. I'm... I'm not going to take my T-shirt off, y'all. It's the first time that everybody, anybody's referred to me as being stellar. So I'm going to keep it on, wear it around the house a lot. Just our announcements today. Uh, I'm Brother Barry Dunn, uh, one of the pastors on staff here. If you're new to us, glad to have you today. Please speak to me uh, before you, uh, we're gone today. And uh, glad, glad that you're here on a special Sunday. If you're watching us by live stream, um, we're glad to have you along the way, and we pray that uh, you may know the presence of Christ wherever you are. And we're First Methodist Church here in Hartzell, and I hope you can join us on our campus uh, real soon, and uh, we'll, we'll be looking forward to meeting you. A few announcements. I want to I thank our leadership team for all their work and how they have um, created an environment of transparency with our affiliation and wanting all of you to know everything that anyone knows about the affiliation uh, opportunities and the process of, of our affiliating in the, uh, down the road. So you'll see uh, some things about that in your announcement sheet. These are also uh, we're made available Wednesday night. I think there's some out for you also to, uh, to look at. This gives you an even uh, deeper breakdown of the opportunities that are before us as a congregation in terms of our affiliation. So uh, please be aware of that. Uh, also, beginning tonight, uh, Phil Waldrop. Many of y'all know about Phil Waldrop Ministries. Somebody was saying to me yesterday, the Phil Waldrop? You know, they know about the, the camps and retreats that he runs up in Gatlinburg and other places, and the men's retreat that was in Huntsville. Yeah, so Phil's uh, from the area and uh, is very much a part of camp meeting, I think, every year. So he's preaching tonight. And then uh, Bobby Ray, Hal Brooks, and myself will be preaching uh, throughout the week. Hope to see you out there. I'm looking forward to being a part of that. I preach tomorrow night. But there's a full schedule uh, here for you ending on Friday. We have some students that are out there as well. And so please be praying uh, that we'll see uh, many souls rescued and, and lives transformed and people back on the path of following uh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so uh, we're praying for that. Also, just a highlight in your announcements, if you will, pay attention to the Hartzell Serve Day. David Evans is helping us at, at our church uh, to make that successful. 
Uh, anybody can participate in Serve Day. If you can pick up trash, if you are physically able to do, to do that, to let our community know that our church uh, cares about our community and loves our community. And so that's on July the 15th. If you'll notice, uh, we're going to meet up at the depot at 7.30 in the morning, be done uh, by lunchtime, and it's going to be some good fellowship and good opportunities to serve. Uh, I think everything else uh, you'll see is uh, sort of self-evident from uh, your announcement sheet, and uh, we're certainly glad that you're here this morning. Uh, we uh, give uh, through tithes and offerings here by some baskets that are out back, and then also uh, by your online giving. Thank you so much for loving your church and for caring about the gospel going not only out in the community, but to the world uh, beyond. And so that is a part of who we are and what we're doing in terms of our stewardship of, your, of your, our, his tithes and our offerings. And uh, so thank you for that. I'm going to offer a word of prayer for us, and then uh, we'll move along in our service. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that today is a day of rest, of Sabbath in your name. We come here on this first day, the, week, the day of your resurrection, Lord Jesus, to celebrate a new life coming into the world and the new life that we have in you. You, you have given the power to become the children of God, led of your spirit, called by your name, we can become all that you would have us to be and intended for us to be when you started all of this in the Garden of Eden. Help us to live into your destiny for us. Help us to live into all that you have for us. Teach us your ways. Show us how to be in relationship with you in a vital and personal way. And that prayer and our opportunity to pray is a privilege granted to you by our relationship with you, O oh Lord. That through Jesus we no longer fear you, but we are favored by you. It's in your strong name, Jesus that we affirm these things and believe these things. And all God's children say, Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we continue in worship together this morning.
you, Jesus. Before you sit down, would you speak to somebody that you did not ride to church with? Would you do that? <laughs> but you got to speak at least to me. <laughs> Amen. What a special day this is. Oh, what a joy it's been to, to see all the kids on Friday night and Saturday morning and today. I, I, we started this last year, and I think it really works. Uh, wasn't it good to see all the kids up singing and worshiping and loving Jesus? Uh, I'm thankful to be a part of the church. Are you thankful to be a part of the kingdom? Uh, that's, what, that's what it's all about. Everything else is sinking sand. But if we're on the rock, it's going to be good. Good now and even better later. I'm telling someone coming in this morning that our retirement system is out of this world. Praise <laughs> the Lord. I look forward to being with Jesus and worshiping Him forever. Hey, are, are you a worshiper? Are you worshiping? You know, you don't be in a big shock when you get to heaven. I mean, if you say, well, I just come and, and I'm just going to watch. You, you will be in for a big surprise in, in heaven because heaven is just filled with worship. And that's what we'll be doing, worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So don't, don't use the excuse, I can't sing. You know, that, that doesn't cut the mustard. Of course, I can't sing. Many of us can't. But we can worship. We can get involved. We, our spirit can lean forward into the bright future God has for us. And we can, oh, with, with joy, we can just be a part of what we're about here at Hearts of First Meth. And it's, and it's good to be a part of the church where God is blessing. Here's our, here's our history in three chapters. If you're a believer this morning, three short chapters. Number one, I was. That's chapter one, what I was. I was lost. I was dead. I was, I was in a pit that I couldn't get out of. I, I was hopelessly headed in the wrong direction. Second chapter, but God. But God came and redeemed me. God came and saved me. God came and gave me life. I was dead in my sins, but God made me alive. Third chapter, and now. That's the chapter we're living in, and now. I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's live out the gospel. God's purpose in your life is for you to be everything that he has created and is recreating us to be. We're going to read from Deuteronomy chapter 4, first nine verses this morning. Today we began a four-part series on the magnificence of prayer. We're, we're going to be talking these next few weeks about how big prayer is, how important prayer is, what a difference prayer makes. It's magnificent. One of, one of my mentors, uh, Alton Parrish, he led a school on prayer when I was at Tuscumbia first, and I wrote in my notes, here's what Alton said about prayer. Prayer is giving ourselves to God in order that he may give himself to us in order that we may give ourselves to others. When we pray, we're saying, okay, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And then God's kingdom comes rushing in, and then we're able to serve him. So we're going to be talking about prayer for four weeks, and then we're going to, as a church, we're going to officially start 40 days of prayer. I mean, of course, you, you, we're going to be praying during these next four weeks. But in August, we're going to begin 40 days of prayer praying for God's will to be done, for his kingdom to come, for discernment. Barry mentioned there are packets available over on the table by the offering box. If you did not get one Wednesday night about the discernment process and how to discern, there's 12 steps there, how to discern. So I encourage you to pick one of those up if you didn't. If we run out, we'll run and get some more. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the magnificence of prayer. Look on the front of your bulletin. Did, did everybody pick up a bulletin on the way in? The, the one-page handout? Would you, would you look at that? Now look at the picture. On, look at the graphic. The magnificence of prayer. That's the big theme. Today we're going to be talking about the wonders of prayer. The wonders of prayer. Uh, do, do you notice those graphics every Sunday on the screen and on the bulletin? Well, Jason, Jason would you raise your hand back? There? Jason is our graphics. He's our IT person. 
Uh, Jason does a fabulous job. We had to outsource all this until we hired Jason to be our IT guy. Now he's doing all this in-house. I, I think that's kind of cool, and you need to thank him. And Kyle's been back there all weekend running the sound for the kids, and, and Jimmy's hipping every Sunday morning in, the, in this special service. So uh, God's church cannot function without you without the people doing what God calls us to do. Let's read together from Deuteronomy chapter 4, first nine verses. Now Israel, hear the decrees and the laws that I'm about to teach you. Of course, the New Testament teaches that we're now Israel. We're, now, we're the new Israel. So these promises, this covenant is for you and me. Because Abraham was blessed, God said, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed through you, through your seed. So let's listen to God's word for us this morning. Hear the decrees and laws that I'm about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land of the Lord, the God of your ancestors that he's giving you. Did you notice that? God's word is powerful. God says, that if you, here's, here's my word, here's my laws, my commands. You keep them and you will live. If you don't keep them, you won't live. You won't have life. So you want to live? You want, we want to have life, don't we? Verse 2, do not add to what I command. Do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. God's word is perfect. God says here, don't add to it. Don't take away from it. And in at the end of Revelation, there's, there's the promise. If you take away from the prophecy of this book, it will be, you, you will not be able to participate in the tree of life. See, if you change God's word to fit your situation, what you believe, what you want to believe, then your part of the tree of life is taken away. You won't get to participate if you change God's perfect law. We have to listen to his word and obey him, and then we'll get to participate. That's a good spot for somebody to say amen. That's an oh me if you're lost. But if you're in Christ, you can say God's law is perfect. And I'm not going to add to it. I'm not going to take away from it because I want life. Verse 3, you saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Peor. Go back and read that. God is faithful to his promises. He keeps his word. He protects those who are faithful to him. Verse 4, but all of you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. Verse 5, see I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land that you're entering to take possession of. Observe them carefully for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say surely this nation is a wise and understanding people. Verse 7, what other nation is so great as to have their gods, notice that's with a little g, near them the way the Lord our God, with a capital G, is near us whenever we pray to him, or whenever we call to him, one translation says it. Verse 8, what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I'm setting before you today? Only be careful. Brothers and sisters, God says to us this morning, be careful. We've got God's word. Now let's be careful. Let's follow his word and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Friday night, as I was able to pray for our children or for Bible school, I, uh, a verse of scripture came to my mind. If we will lead them in the way they're to go when they're little, when they're old, they'll, they'll not depart from it. They'll return to it. And I prayed that, that God would give our little boys and girls at least one verse this week that they'll never forget. That they'll have the seed of the gospel at least. And that they'll always know that God is real and God loves us and God has a plan to redeem our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, as we began these next four weeks looking into your word and studying, Lord, about the importance of prayer, the magnificence of prayer. Lord, illuminate our hearts and our minds. Lord, renew us from the inside out so that we can 
line up with your word, with your light, and with the path that you have for us. Lord, I pray that you will just permit me to preach this morning. Hide me behind the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Our key verse is verse 7. What other nation is so great to have their gods near them the way that our Lord is near us whenever we pray to him? Have you prayed this morning? Whenever we pray, when, when we pray sincerely and in truth, God listens and he answers. Look at the next verse. This illustrates this. Psalm 145 verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth. God's near and he's near to those who call on him in truth. You see, God doesn't answer every prayer. I'm talking about those that are unbelievers. But God answers the prayers of those who call on him in truth. Tony Dungy, uh, the retired now NFL football coach who won a Super Bowl at Indianapolis. Tony Dungy recently spoke at a men's gathering. This was in Decision Magazine. I read just this past week. Tony Dungy said, those people who hate the truth think that it's hateful. Just, let's, just think about this a second. Those people who hate the truth, they're going to think it's hateful. But those people who love the truth, they're going to think it's lovely or loving. And that's the way it is, isn't it? When we approach God in truth, we don't try and change anything. We just say, okay, Lord, here's, here's your word, here's your law, here's your commands. We, we, we soon to realize because we, have a want, we develop a wonderful relationship with him uh, that he's in us and we're in him and we're abiding and we're calling on his name and he's listening and he's answering. Prayer is grabbing a hold to the hand that moves the world. These next few weeks and then as we go into discernment, let's make sure that we're grabbing hold of that hand that's going to move the world because I want to go where God's going. I want to follow where the Lord is, don't you? Uh, all right, let's look at four things today. Four wonders of prayer. There are other things that, that we could say. I just want to highlight these four things. The four wonders of prayer. As we, as we focus on the truth of God's Word. We live in a time where, where truth is very important, don't we? Ministry Watch, I, I receive emails weekly from Ministry Watch. They, they keep up with, with things that's going on in the church. If a pastor, if a church goes off the rail, they report it. Ministry Watch is a very good uh, addition to my weekly reading to just know what's happening. W Ministry Watch did a report this week on mainline denominations. They reported on 10. Let me just, just very briefly, let me just, they, they highlighted the United Methodist Church. And by the way, they're, they're predicting that the United Methodist Church just this year alone will lose 40% of its membership through disaffiliation and through those who are just leaving in mass, 40% in one year. But they highlight also the Presbyterian Church. The Presbyterian Church USA, the Presbyterian Church PCA. Uh, the USA is the one in 1983 who, who went progressive. Uh, PCA is the one who tried to stick to the orthodoxy of Scripture. In 1983, the Presbyterian Church USA had 3.1 million members. Today, they have 1.1 million. That's the ones who went progressive. The other Presbyterian church, PCA, the one who said, we're going to stick to the authority of Scripture, they have doubled in that same time frame. I'm very thankful that we made a wise decision and that we chose to follow God's plan, follow the truth. Already, things are in chaos here in North Alabama in the United Methodist Church. I don't have time to go into it today, but they finished their annual conference this week. Our, district, our former district superintendent said, nothing's going to change here in Alabama. This is the Bible Belt. She was wrong. Things have changed in a hurry. So let's, let's focus on the necessity to pray in truth, to call on his name so that he will hear and answer and, and show us great and mighty things. Number one, there's no promise too hard for the Lord to fulfill. That's the first wonder of prayer I'd like to talk for just a moment about. There's no promise too hard for God to fulfill. Has anybody ever made you a promise and didn't keep it? Promises are important, aren't they? Promises speak of commitment. When somebody says, I'm going to do it, they're saying, yeah, you can count on me. Broken promises, uh, they hurt. But God makes promises, and God keeps his word. 
I hope you believe that. Let's just look at a couple of verses of Scripture to illustrate how God keeps His Word. He keeps His promises. Jeremiah 33, 3. Of course, I've mentioned before, this is God's private phone number. You need to make sure you got this number. J-E-R-E-333. All right, that's God's private phone number. Let's see what it says. Call to me. God says, call to me, and I'll answer you. Show you great and mighty things. 1 Kings 8, 56. This is Solomon's prayer as the temple has been dedicated. He's been kneeling in prayer with his hands outstretched. He stands up and then he makes this declaration. Praise be to the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel just as he promised. Not one word. I've got that circled. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. Not one word. Aren't you thankful for God's promises? God keeps his word. His promises are yes and amen to those who are in him. Jesus made some precious promises. Let me, let me just quickly mention four. Jesus said, if you hear me knocking and open the door and invite me in, he said, I will come in. He promises salvation. That's one of the I wills. That's a promise of the Lord to you and me. He said, behold, I stand at your door and knock, Revelation 3.20. Whoever hears me knocking and opens the door, I will come in. And Jesus can't lie. I can't tell you how many boys and girls, how many youth I've, I've prayed with to accept Christ. And then I'll, I'll mention that verse. What did you just do? Did you mean it? Well, where's Jesus living right now? And the, it's like a light comes up. Well, he's in my heart because he said he would come in. Jesus says, I will. He keeps his promises. He said in Matthew, he said, if you're burdened and weary and heavy laden, he said, come to me and I will give you rest. Aren't you thankful? I need that rest. I need renewal. We all do. Jesus promises to give us rest. Jesus promises to make us usable. He said, come and follow me and I will make you. He was talking to his fishermen. He said, I will make you fishers of men. But whatever it is we need, he will make us serviceable in the kingdom of God. I will make you. We'll come to him, receive salvation and rest. And he says, I will, I will make you. He says, John 14, I'm not going to leave you alone. I will come to you. He's talking about the precious Holy Spirit, the comforter. He said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm, 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 I'm leaving. I've got to go, but I'm going to pray to the Father, and the Father's going to give his spirit to be with you and within you. I will be with you. Isn't it good to know he's with us? He's in us. He said, I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, you know what the next phrase is? I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am there, you may be also. Some of you have heard about the classic Pilgrim's Progress. I won't ask how many people have read Pilgrim's Progress. Years ago, you could ask this, and almost 90% of the congregation would raise their hand. But we've kind of we've kind of wandered from some of the classics. But Paul Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress, Christian is on his way to the celestial city, and hopeful is his traveling companion. And along the way, they get locked up in Doubting Castle. And giant despair has got them there in Doubting Castle. Maybe somebody's been in Doubting Castle lately, and maybe giant despair has got you locked up in a dungeon. Well, listen to what Paul Bunyan wrote years ago in the 1600s. He says, well, on Saturday, about midnight, they'd been locked up from Wednesday to Saturday. About Saturday, about midnight, they began to pray, and they continued in prayer till almost the break of day. Now, a little before it was day, good Christian, as one half amazed, he broke out into his passionate speech, what a fool, quote he, I have been, thus to lie in a stinking dungeon when I may as well walk at liberty. I have a key in my bosom called promise that will, I am persuaded, open any lock in Doubting Castle. And then said hopeful, that's good news, good brother. Pluck it out of your bosom and try. And then he pulled it out, and I won't read the next paragraph, but every door unlocked when he used the promise key. 
Would you call God's promises to your heart this morning? And every door is going to open. You'll get out of Doubting Castle. You'll get through the iron gate that leads back to the road that will lead you to the celestial city. God's promises are like a, a gift card. Anybody ever given you a gift card? Maybe to Walmart or just a Visa? God's promises are like a, a gift card that's unlimited. You can never exhaust the resources that's on that gift card. It's, it's like a, a check that's written on heaven's bank. Whenever you need, you call on God's word. You, you believe the promises. The promises of God will help you, will deliver you. There, there's no promise that God cannot fulfill. The second, second thing I'd like to say this morning, there's no prayer too hard for God to answer. God fulfills all of his promises. He answers prayers of his children. Jeremiah 32, 17. Let's look at two verses out of Jeremiah 32. O sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. I'm going to try this in the traditional church. It ought to go well here in our contemporary service. Nothing is too hard for you. Would you repeat that with me? I mean, it's pretty, nothing is too hard for you. All right, when I count three, let's say that together. One, two, three. Nothing is too hard for you. Let's do it again. That was poor. Right. You better claim God's promises this morning and rest in his arms. Nothing is too hard for you. Let's do it again. Nothing is too hard for you. Let's believe that. And then God says in 10 verses later, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? God says nothing is too hard for me. Any prayer that we lift up to God, uh, he will answer. We're redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And, and these three things have to fall in place if you want your prayers answered. I'm going to read two verses from Romans 8. Romans 8, 26, 27, if you're taking notes. Romans 8, 26, and 27 says that, that God helps us when we don't know what to say, when we don't know what to ask, when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit helps us. He makes intercessions through us. He helps us to discern what the will of the Father is. So if a prayer is going to be answered, it has to be according to the will of God. The Spirit of God has to birth that prayer in us. The second thing, it has to be according to His will. It, 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 it can't be for selfish reasons. James chapter 4, verse 2 and 3 makes this very clear. First of all, God speaks through the apostle James and says, you don't have because you don't ask. And then the next verse, verse 3 says, you ask and you don't receive because you've asked amiss. You've asked selfish prayers. So for our prayers to work and to be answered, they have to be born of the Spirit. Hey, if something hangs on to your shoulder for a week or two, it may be God. If I think of something and then a day later I've forgotten it, I realize that was, not, that was me. But if it's something I can't let go, that's probably God. Prayer that's born of the Spirit, that's not mixed with selfishness. Hey, on one side of the baseball diamond, you got a mom praying that her son's going to hit the ball. And on the other side of the diamond, you got a mom praying that her son's going to strike out the batter. <laughs> How's God going to answer that one? Well, that, that, those prayers are not born of the Spirit. That's just, that's just what we want to happen. But if it's born of the Spirit, and it's not mixed with selfishness, and it's in the name of Jesus, John 14, 12, and 13. If, it's in the, if we pray in the name of Jesus. And, and that doesn't mean say whatever you want and then tack on it then in the name of Jesus, amen. That is not what that means. That's what most of us in the church, we do. We say, we'll, we'll pray whatever we want to pray and then we'll say in the name of Jesus, amen. But praying in the name of Jesus means that we're, we're going to continue the work that he began. We're going to continue the process that he began. We're going to continue the plan that he has implemented. We're going, to, we're going to pray that, Lord, use us. Let me be a part of your work. I want to pray like you would pray if you were here. And you are here, and you're in me. So let my prayer be in your name, in your place. Lord, I'm in your stead. I'm doing your work. When those three things happen, God's going to answer our prayers. So let's make sure during this time of learning to pray and, 
and then praying and then saying, okay, God, we want your kingdom to come, that we, we let the Holy Spirit birth in us what he wants, and then we get ourselves out of the way. We, we don't live with uh, double-mindedness, and then we say, okay, Lord, I want you to live through me. I want to I wanna pray like you would pray if you were here. There's no prayer too hard for God to answer. Let's look at the third thing. There is no problem too hard for God to solve. In 2 Kings chapter 6 and then in Acts chapter 12, you see Elisha had a big problem. But praise God, he had a bigger God. You ever had a big problem? You didn't know how to handle it. You got a bigger God. Elisha, the prophet of God, I don't have time to tell the, most of the story, but the king of Aram had he and his servants surrounded in a city called Dothan. And his servant got up early the next morning and went out and saw the Aramean army, horses and chariots surrounding the city. And he runs back in and he tells Elisha, the man of God, they've got us surrounded. What are we going to do? There, there are many, many, many soldiers out there. And Elisha just said, Lord, open his eyes. Let him see. Elisha said, those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. And aren't you thankful for that this morning? Those, the one who is with us is greater than the ones who's in the world. God's church is always going to prevail. God's church is going to stand. Open his eyes, Lord, and let him see. And that servant looked, and there were, there were chariots of horses and fire all around those other soldiers. Chariots of horses and fire. Maybe some of you saw the famous movie, Chariots of Fire. That's where that came from. Chariots of horses and fire all around. And God provided a miracle. See, there's no, there's no problem too big for God. If you will just surrender to Him and trust Him and love on Him and let Him love on you and abide in Him, then His grace will be sufficient. There's no problem too big for God. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 12, Peter's in prison. The, King Herod has locked him up. He's going to send him out just like James and be killed. But God does a miracle because verse 5 tells us that, that the people of God, the church, they were earnestly praying. God's people were praying and God sent an angel and set Peter free. You remember he went to the house where they were praying. He knew that they'd be praying. He went to their house and he knocked on the door and, and a servant named Rhoda came to the door and, and she recognized Peter's voice and, and she was so excited. She didn't let him in. She went back and told the rest, Peter's here. And they said, no, 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 he's locked up. He can't be here. And they finally went because he continued knocking and let him in. No problem. Too big for God. Hey, I've had problems in my life. You had problems? Hey, God has called us to be more than conquerors, to be overcomers in him. In him we prevail. E.M. Bounds, let me read this short quote. E.M. Bounds was a, a Methodist pastor during the Civil War days because the church he pastored had Methodist Episcopal Church South on it. The Union officers locked him up, put him in prison. And in prison, he ministered to Confederate soldiers who were locked up. E.M. Bounds, the great man of prayer, he, he wrote many books about prayer. Here's one quote. He said, what the church needs today, and remember, he wrote this in the 1800s. So I'm going to add men and women. He just said men because that was, that was acceptable then. So I'm going to add and women. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more and better methods, but men and women whom the Holy Spirit can use. Men and women of prayer, men and women who are mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods. We need to hear this loud and clearly. The Holy Spirit doesn't flow through methods, but through men and women. He does not flow through machinery, but on men and women. He does not anoint plans, but men and women, men and women of prayer. Hallelujah. If we pray, God's going to listen. And if we pray, God listens, and He's going to move. Let's make sure we're, we're calling on the name of the Lord in truth and, 
God's going to meet our needs. There's no problem too big for God to solve. Last of all, there's no place too hard for God to revive. There's not. There's not, there's not any situation, not any place you can think of that God can't revive. You know why? Because places are just made up of people. And God can revive hearts. And he will. 1 John 5, 14 says, let's read it together. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Again, we, we talked a little bit about what's his will. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. The rest of that verse says, and he will answer us. He will give us our requests. We pray according to his will. Maybe there's somebody here this morning saying, Lord, I, I, I want to be revived. Lord, I want to be changed. Lord, I need you. It's kind of prayers you know God's going to answer. We have 100% confidence that that's in the will of God because he says, whoever calls on me, I, I will deliver, I will save. Joel's prophecy, in the latter days, the Spirit's going to be poured out upon all people. And then whoever called upon the name of the Lord would be saved. God wants to deliver us. He wants to save us. He wants to set us free. There's a passage in Ezekiel about are you dry? It's about dry bones. Ezekiel was caught up by the Spirit and he saw a huge valley of dry bones. And he walked through them in his vision. And they were they were separated they were dry. And the Spirit said, do you think these bones can live again? And Ezekiel said, Lord, you, you know the answer to that. And God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones. Speak to these bones. Speak to these dead, dry bones. And Ezekiel did. And God did a miracle and raised them up. He raised up the people of God who were dead in a, in a valley. And he gave them life. Is anybody dry this morning? Maybe you feel like your life is disconnected from everything important. One day John Wesley was preaching in England. He had been driven out of the church and he had to preach outdoors. And he was preaching outdoors one evening. After the service, he, he, he records this in his journal. After the service, a man came up to him and had a rock in his hand. And he said, Mr. Wesley... I came to this service to break your head with this rock. But you have broken my heart. Hard hearts can be broken. Wheels that have gone in the wrong direction can be changed and we can be put on the light in the path that leads to righteousness, that leads to God's kingdom. Remember, it's our story. I was dead, but God and now, I'm an ambassador of Christ. I'm following him. Are you, are you ready to say, Lord, I want that to be my story? I want us to spend a few moments in prayer this morning. We're going to do more praying as we go through these next four weeks. You can pray at the altar rails. You can pray right here in front of the, the risers. You, you can walk up and kneel and pray in front of this first row if you want to. Or you can pray right where you are. Let's, let's have, would you give me two minutes of prayer? Would you give the Lord two minutes of prayer? It may seem like an eternity to you, but you find a place and you kneel or you sit and you pray. And whatever, whatever God has spoken to you today out of his word, if it, if it was my opinion, my suggestion, my thoughts, just forget it. But whatever the Holy Spirit said to you out of his word, you right now, you begin to pray about that and say, okay, Lord, here I am. Uh, I'm your servant. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Fall afresh upon us. Fill us with your power. Lord, only you can make us whole. Only you can help us grow. Come, Holy Spirit. Fall afresh upon us. Amen. Let's pray together. And after two minutes, I'll nod at Teresa and she'll start leading us in our last song. Let's pray. Two minutes.
been invited into a season of prayer over the next four weeks and I hope you'll receive that invitation and you know a good place as Mike has uh, so wonderfully lifted up to us a good place for us uh, to begin is with ourselves and taking long enough time in your life to be still long enough to contemplate at that cross and bringing every bit of your life and every circumstance that you have and everything that lays before us as a church, bringing it at all at the foot of that cross and staying there long enough to know that it's at the foot of that cross that the answers uh, are going to come. And so we bring ourselves there. I want to lead us in a closing benediction prayer and 
including it, my prayer for us as a people of God, as Mike leads us in this time, and as we gather at the foot of his cross. So let's pray together. Lord, we all know that it is from you that we derive our name. It is out of your glorious riches, strengthened by the power of your Spirit, that we dwell in you through hearts filled with faith. I pray, O oh God, that being a Christian is not something that we call ourselves, but it is descriptive of our lives that we are rooted and established in heaven's love. Having to, the power together with all of those who are called by your name to grasp how wide and long, how high and deep is the love of heaven in Christ Jesus. And to know that kind of love that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. And so as we leave this place, we know that you are able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine according to your power that is at work in us, to the glory of your church, and to the glory of Jesus Christ throughout all generations, now and forever. Go in peace. Amen. Shake a hand, hug a neck. Tell somebody you're glad to see them this morning. Love you, brother. Great job, y'all.